Uh, we have with us two government officials, uh, journalists, academics, uh, who will comment on, on uh, the presentations. We have no formal academic papers at this particular, uh, particular forum, uh, but our, uh, our participants will offer some remarks, approximately 10 to 12 minutes in length. Then there'll be an opportunity for them to ask one another questions, and then there will be the opportunity for you in the audience to ask questions as well. I'm going to introduce everyone on this panel um, as quickly as I can, because we're more interested in what they have to say. Uh, I would alert you, however, this is going till 4.20. At 4.10, uh, Director Goss and, and Ambassador Negroponte have to, to leave, so I don't think they'll be making any particular statement if they, they leave before this is done. Porter J. Goss served as the 19th and last Director of Central Intelligence from September 24, 2004, until April 21, 2005. At that time, he became the first director of the Central Intelligence Agency under the newly signed Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act. He continued in that position until May 2006. Previously, uh, Director Goss had served as a congressman from Southwest Florida for almost 16 years. He was chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence from 1997 until his nomination as DCI in August 2004. He served for almost a decade as a member of the committee, which oversees the intelligence communi community and authorizes its annual budget. During the 107th Congress, Mr. Goss co-chaired the Joint Congressional Inquiry into the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. He was the second director of Central Intelligence to have served in Congress. John D. Negroponte is a Brady Johnson Distinguished Fellow in Grand Strategy and Senior Lecturer in Global Affairs at the Jackson Institute of Yale University. Prior to joining Yale, Ambassador Negroponte built a distinguished career in diplomacy and national security, followed by a number of years in the private sector. He held government positions abroad and in Washington between 1960 and 1997, and again from 2001 to 2008. He has been U.S. Ambassador to Honduras, Mexico, the Philippines, the United Nations, and Iraq. He served twice on the National Security Council staff, first as director for Vietnam in the Nixon administration, and then as deputy national security advisor under President Reagan. He also held a cabinet level position as the first director of national intelligence under President George W. Bush. Carolyn Eisenberg is a professor of US history and foreign policy at Hofstra author of a prize-winning book on the American occupation of Germany. She has written and spoken widely about U.S. policy in Iraq, served as a consultant to several members of Congress, and in 2004, chaired a task force on the U.S. occupation of Iraq for a bipartisan coalition for a realistic foreign policy. Her articles have appeared in the Journal of American History, History News Network, Diplomatic History, Radical History Review, and Nova. She is presently completing a book entitled Never Lose, Nixon Kissinger and the Illusion of National Security. Stephen F. Knott is a professor of national security affairs at the United States Naval War College. He served as co-chair of the University of Virginia's Presidential Oral History Program and directed the Ronald Reagan Oral History Project. Professor Knott received his PhD in political science from Boston College and is taught at the United States Air Force Academy and the University of Virginia. He is the author of Alexander Hamilton and the Persistence of Myth and Secret and Sanctioned Covert Operations in the American Presidency, the latter an examination of the use of covert operations by early American presidents. He is a co-author of The Reagan Years and at Reagan's side, Insider's Recollections from Sacramento to the White House. Dr. Knott's most recent book, Rush to Judgment, 
George W. Bush and the War on Terror and His Critics was published in March 2012. Amy Goodman is the host and executive producer of Democracy Now!, a national, daily, independent, award-winning news program airing on over 1,300 public television and radio stations worldwide. Ms. Goodman has co-authored five New York, New York Times bestsellers. Her work has earned her numerous honors and awards. The Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard honored Goodman with the 2014 I Have Stone Medal for Journalistic Independence Lifetime Achievement. She's also the first journalist to have received the Right Livelihood Award, widely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize for, quote, developing an innovative model of truly independent, grassroots political journalism that brings to millions of people the alternative voices that are often excluded by the mainstream media, end quote. Ms. Goodman was recipient of the American Women in Radio and Television Gracie Award, the Paley Center for Media She's Made It Award, and the Puffin Nation Prize for Creative Citizenship. Her reporting on East Timor and Nigeria has won numerous awards, including the George Polk Award, Robert F. Kennedy Prize for International Reporting, and the Alfred I. DuPont Award. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Director Gibson to begin this discussion. Thank you very much. We've just had a very refreshing session uh, next door with uh, some students and some other folks in the audience who asked some very penetrating questions. Uh, about the Bush Doctrine and our security and the threats. And I uh, tell you that it is very stimulating for somebody like me coming back here and seeing who are people really interested in things that matter today uh, and taking good questions under advisement and willing to tackle some of the more controversial issues that we've got. I think to talk about the Bush uh, Doctrine uh, a little bit, you need to understand it was really the change of a century it was the beginning of new times, new landscape, new challenges in a way that we hadn't quite expected. And not only that, we were dealing with some new thoughts, but we were dealing with some old machinery. Some of the old uh, institutions that had gotten accustomed to doing things a certain way, uh, certainly that would go to including some nations that were accustomed to having things happen in certain ways. It would go to uh, organizations that involved many countries, such as perhaps NATO or the UN. All of a sudden, things changed, and people had to come to grips with a new challenge. And President Bush, uh, a very few short months into his presidency, had to deal with that. From my perspective, uh, starting out on the uh, role of the chairman of the Oversight Committee in the House uh, that deal, dealt with the uh, ability to get intelligence to advise the president of what he needed to know, I can say that the United States of America was not fully prepared to give the president all of the best advice and best information that he needed to have to make the decisions that he needed to make. We were woefully hollowed out after the peace dividend, and nobody is blaming anybody for the peace dividend. That was a good thing we had. But the fact of the matter is we sort of let our guard down and will continue to march forward while we were enjoying that peace dividend. So when 9-11 actually happened to us, uh, it was a large, large wake-up call, and we had to take stock very, very quickly, and we found that just about every cupboard we'd looked into had a, a certain amount of depletion to it or was just plain outright bare. I remember as the uh, chairman of the committee asking our intelligence people, uh, how many Arab speakers do we have uh, who can help me and help my colleagues on this committee uh, understand what's going on? And the answer was woefully few. Uh, it was little things like that that opened our eyes very quickly. But I would emphasize, in that period, the President understood that we needed to ramp up capability fast. Now, in the intelligent world, you just don't go out and hire five spies. Uh, it takes time to recruit good, 
clandestine service people and it isn't done overnight but the president committed early on to rebuilding our clandestine service overseas and our operational capabilities and we do have the world's greatest intelligence organization uh, in the world we have certainly the greatest uh, capabilities uh, intelligence capabilities in the world what we don't have and what we haven't had consistency is the policies on how to use them because we're a free democratic open society and leading that debate about where the line is between your privacy and your protection from uh, the ability of the government to get information on you or about you uh, is a debate that should go on and will go on, I hope always, in our free democratic open society because we never want the pendulum to swing too far one way or the other. We want to be safe, but we don't want George Orwell's big brother looking over our shoulders uh, every time we want to do something. President Bush understood that very well and tried very hard to find that balance and to perpetually keep that in front of us on the Hill so that we stayed between the lanes between serving the United States of America and keeping it safe on the one hand without getting into the, the private or the civil rights uh, of the citizens that we all work for and represent. So I would say that the way it finally came out, if I had to give just a few words, is the hallmarks of the Bush doctrine, once we saw what we were up against after the horrors of 9-11, were strength, commitment, and engagement. And I think that the President did an extraordinary job of getting us energized at a time when there was an audience in the world that was listening to and watching to see what the United States of America was indeed going to do. I think the President was let down somewhat uh, by the information he got. I don't feel that the intelligence community, uh, as good as it is, uh, it wasn't as good then, as I said, it had been hot out, and as wonderful as the men and women uh, who are in the intelligence community, and they are wonderful people, uh, put up great sacrifice. I don't think that the President truly had all of the information he needed. I know he made statements that he thought were true that turned out to be wrong, because we had bad information. And that is going to happen. We are always going to have victims if we do not have good intelligence. So this is a shameless call for everybody to understand we need good intelligence at all times in our country because we might get better decisions uh, instead of making big mistakes. My time uh, in the Hill uh, ended up with our review of the uh, what happened on 9-11 and how it came to pass. And uh, you could point a lot of fingers at a lot of people and a lot of institutions and say this happened and that happened. But the fact of the matter is when you're talking about a free democratic open society, we were just going about our business and, and enjoying the wonderful land and the blessings we have. We probably should have been paying more attention and not have dropped our guard, but we did. And I think that was a collective decision we made as Americans. So we got back on track and we started to do things. Uh, I went down uh, to the pre talk to the president and he asked if I would be his, the DCI after George Tenet announced his resignation, uh, somewhat uh, unexpectedly, uh, in the summer, right before an election coming up, before a presidential election. And this is not a time that most people would say, gee, uh, Mr. President, if you happen to lose this election, I'm out of a job, uh, maybe I don't want to do this. Uh, fact of the matter is, I really wanted to get out of Washington uh, I had been in Congress about as long as I needed to be and wanted to be, and so I was looking for an exit, and uh, unfortunately I didn't find it. Instead, I found a great challenge for the President of the United States, and my job involved five things. First of all, I was the DCI, the last of the DCIs, because Congress was <coughs> beginning to lose uh, some concern, had some concern, they were losing control of the intelligence community, and they wanted a little bit tighter rein on it. So they decided some new architecture was necessary. So the DCI looked like it was going to be a short-term job. But it was nevertheless a job that required managing 15 agencies in the intelligence community, not all of whom I had much of control over, and some of whom had cabinet officers and very important chairman on the Hill uh, in charge of. So this is a quite a team of people 
that a person who has not got cabinet level status uh, has to deal with and supposedly manage. That was job one. Job two was running CIA, which as I said needed to be rebuilt and rebuilt in a hurry. Number three was fighting the war. We had a war going on. We didn't know what the next step was going to be, whether, whether we were going to get hit again or where it was going to come from. That was sort of an important job every day. And every day we met uh, in the agency's war room and went over where we were and what was happening. Then we had the whole question of the real problem of the agency's job is to advise the president. And that's done through something called the PDB, the Presidential Daily Briefing. And that is compiling the best information that the president needs to have at the moment every given morning. And to have a half an hour or so of the president's ear every day is an extraordinary honor, but it's just a whale of a responsibility. Just think about that. You're talking to the most important person in the world. You want to get it right. The temptation is always to give the president the worst case scenario and then walk away. But if you do that, you might not have given him the most likely scenario. So we had some problems sorting out what really could go wrong and what was likely to go wrong. And in those days when we weren't sure, that was an extremely hard job. It took about five hours of my day uh, every day. And then the last thing to do was Congress did indeed pass a law and we had a new architect, new architecture, and a new setup, which I think Ambassador Negroponte will talk about because he was the, became the chief of that operation. And that meant uh, that we had to spend some time readjusting how all these 15 agencies worked with each other. I don't think there is a human being in the world who could do this job. I truly don't. I said that in Los Angeles, uh, was uh, widely harassed for it. But the truth of the matter is other people who tried to do all five of those things uh, while they were uh, extant uh, had similar uh, thoughts about doing them. I think that the good part of it all is that we got through it in a very sane American way that does credit to us all. We ended up on the right side of just about every one of, of those uh, issues uh, that we had to deal with. Now, the last thing I'm going to say about uh, the Bush doctrine, uh, given the fact that we were at this time of change, was I think President Bush was so clearly aware of the fact that we were not necessarily dealing state to state anymore, that we were dealing with people who are outside of the conventional norm. And these people were ruthless troublemakers. And again, I am speaking of radical fundamentalists. I'm not addressing all of Islam or Muslim people or anything. I'm talking about the radical fundamentalists who declared war on us and hurt us grievously because we had let our guard down. The president never wanted that guard to be down again, and he never wanted to give those folks a sanctuary, a place where they could train, where they could get money, where they could make their plans, where they could arrange their travel, where they could manufacture their passports, put out their propaganda, and do all of that stuff. The president got that, and he did something about it. He understood very well that the radical fundamentalists understood strength, respected strength, and he also understood that they would take advantage of weakness and disengagement. He got that part absolutely right. And for that, we owe him a great deal. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, speak with you this afternoon about uh, the Bush, uh, W. Bush uh, era. Uh, perhaps first, before going into the principal part of my comments, let me just pick up on a couple of things that uh, Director Goss has said, and uh, one is a kind of a detail, but an interesting one, and that is the President's uh, daily brief. And uh, when we made the transition from Porter being the DCI to my becoming the Director of National Intelligence, there was about a month or so where we went in to see the President together at 8 o'clock every morning to brief him. So uh, that for me was a very 
helpful and uh, an interesting time to transition over to doing it uh, myself with the PDB staff uh, in the ensuing months. But one thing I want to say about President Bush, and this is now 2005, right? He's been in office four years. Uh, when any president's been in office four years, they, they know the situation pretty well. They've met a lot of leaders. They meet dozens of leaders, national leaders, every international leaders every uh, year. Uh, it's kind of hard to give them a leadership profile, if you will, on somebody uh, who they just saw the previous week at a, uh, a NATO meeting or at a uh, ASEAN meeting or at a meeting of uh, the APEC countries. And he was a particularly good customer. Uh, George W. Bush really was uh, fascinated by intelligence. He, uh, he absorbed it. Uh, he liked that half hour that he spent every day, and it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just five days a week. It was six days a week that we uh, briefed him, and I think he was one of the best uh, customers of intelligence that uh, uh, I've ever uh, known. He had a dialectical style. He didn't. Uh, he would look at the briefer and say, "Well, look, you guys wrote this. Why don't you just tell me what it says?" Because he 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 much preferred to have a uh, conversation. About, about issues than uh, to actually read the material, or he would do that if, uh, uh, if he felt he, he ought to. But uh, I can remember sometimes we would bring in people in addition to the regular articles that we would show them every morning, usually six or seven articles in the form of uh, maybe a one page, page and a half long. Sometimes we do a so-called deep dive, a situation in a particular country of interest, or a, a discussion of the leadership in a, a country which, uh, whose leaders were both important to us and maybe particularly inscrutable. And uh, uh, we'd do this deep dive, and, and he would really get into uh, the discussion and valued it a great deal, and we would bring young analysts from the CIA or from the DIA or wherever to present their views directly to the president. It was a it was a good experience for the president. It was a good experience, uh, maybe a little bit intimidating at first for some of the analysts, but once they got used to it, uh, they accounted for themselves uh, very well. Not every president um, devotes that much attention, concentrated, scheduled time to absorbing their daily uh, intelligence. Uh, we used to, uh, when I worked uh, with Colin Powell, I was when I was his deputy. We just gave the. We, he didn't even have an intelligence briefing every day. We were his national security and deputy national security advisors, respectively, and we would simply give him the president's daily brief, the book uh, that uh, he was then at his leisure to read some during the course of the day, and then he would give it back to us by the end of the day. Occasionally, if there was an article we felt we ought to highlight for him, uh, we would do that. So different presidents have had different uh, styles. Uh, Bill Clinton apparently uh, didn't uh, ever meet an intelligence briefer, and there was that famous uh, story about the crash of the small plane on the White House lawn and somebody quipping that it was uh, CIA Director Jim Woolsey trying to get in to see the president. Um, so anyway, we had a a good customer, and, he, and, he sh and I'm sure he became an even better customer after 9-11. Uh, um, the second point I'd like to make before getting to our topic is that I thought that Peter Baker and others this morning made a very good point when they said that you really have to think of the presidency as dynamic as evolving, and that essentially you've got two phases of the Bush presidency. You have those first four years uh, and the second four, and they were really quite different. And they were different uh, because of changing circumstances, but also because of changing faces. Uh, Condi Rice moved over to become the Secretary of State. She put priority then on maybe taking a more diplomatic approach to a number of, uh, of issues. Uh, Vice President Cheney became less influential. Uh, perhaps some of 
this had to do with issues of health. I don't think he was perhaps necessarily as energetic in the second term uh, as he uh, was in the first. And shortly into the second term, Secretary Rumsfeld left office and he was replaced by Robert Gates. So, so the, the atmospherics were different. And I think that goes to the issue of the Bush Doctrine, uh, which I'm coming to now. Uh, when I think, when I see the words Bush Doctrine and combating terrorism, I immediately think about the different justifications for the wars in Afghanistan, the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq. And I was at the UN uh, when both of these uh, wars were, were launched. Uh, the war in Afghanistan, uh, in fact, I was notified by a, a flash telegram at, on a Sunday, I think it was Sunday, October 6th of 2001, uh, uh, seek out the president of the Security Council and ask for a Security Council meeting this evening to inform the council that we are going to be uh, launching attacks into Afghanistan in the exercise <coughs> of our self-defense under fifth, Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. And we dutifully uh, did that that evening in the council. And I don't think we really had any argument from anybody uh, uh, as to the fact that we were retaliating against uh, Afghanistan for uh, it, it retaliating because of the 9-11 attacks. I think that was well understood, both internationally uh, and in our own country. There was an interesting footnote to that day for me, which I think was a harbinger of uh, issues to come. And that was that the second part of my instruction said, by the way, you should also seek out the ambassador to the United Nations of Iraq. This is Sunday, October 6, 2001, mind you. And uh, you should seek him out uh, urgently and basically read to him the following talking points. And the, the talking points were very tough. They said, if you, and I'm paraphrasing here and put it, making it a bit colloquial, but it was if you, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, even think about taking advantage of this situation that is created by our preoccupation with Afghanistan, uh, there will be hell to pay. I won't fill in all the blanks about what, but, but it was a very, it was almost threatening uh, in its language. Now this is uh, uh, 2001 and you know, in retrospect, even though I was involved in negotiating the resolution 1441 uh, in the fall of 2002 that led to the reinstatement of an inspection regime in Iraq, in retrospect, it was clear that we sort of had, the administration had Iraq on its mind right from uh, the beginning after 9-11. And if you read George Bush's book on, uh, called Decision Points, uh, he explains that he met about military operations against Iraq as early as December of 2001, and he had 12 subsequent meetings or telephone conversations with General Franks between December of 2001 and the summer of, uh, uh, of 2002. So that, um, and I wasn't nearly as conscious of this at the time in 2002 when I was working on negotiating this inspection resolution. I th thought we had more time to allow for an inspection regime to work. Well, as it turned out, that was more a matter of form and it's, it would appear that the decision had been made exactly when, I heard Porter say in the earlier panel that we don't know exactly when, we're not entirely certain, but uh, it, it seems pretty clear to me that the administration's mind was made up at some point, um, even as we were going to the United Nations, that we were in fact going uh, to invade Iraq. And I think that is, uh, really the issue around which turns this whole question of the uh, judgment of the Bush doctrine, the doctrine, doctrine of preemption uh, and of unilateral action. 
Um, ironically, it's something of an exception to the rest of George W. Bush's foreign policy, uh, and he certainly evolved towards a more moderate stance, but it was such an important exception, and it became such a major issue, and the, so much blood and treasure was expended in Iraq that I, I think it's going to, for a long time at least, going to remain uh, um, the major foreign policy issue on which the George W. Bush uh, administration uh, is going to be a uh, judge. I think with beginning in the second term, the, uh, Mr. Bush and his advisors fell back into a more sort of traditional American foreign policy approach, trying more to uh, avoid uh, unilateral action, if at all possible. I can recall, because I was Deputy Secretary of State at the time, and also when I was in, uh, in the Director of National Intelligence, rumors uh, during the second administration, is almost constant, particularly on Wall Street for some reason, that we were going to attack Iran. But I know from the internal discussion uh, in the White House and elsewhere at the time that nothing was further from our minds. I don't think Mr. Bush wanted to uh, add to the litany of issues and problems that we had on our hands at that time. I think the, the, the issue of Iran was more of trying to contain its uh, nuclear development uh, program uh, through either diplomacy or by economic sanctions, but I don't think that uh, military action against Iran was ever seriously contemplated, and uh, a related point, uh, there was talk at the time and subsequently about Israel probably possibly taking such action against Iran, but we have to remember that any kind of effort to uh, eliminate Iran's nuclear capabilities uh, would involve a major military action. It isn't a one-off thing the way uh, Israel's uh, bombing the uh, Iraqi reactor in 1981 or the Syrian nuclear reactor uh, in 2007 was, so, and, and there's, I think, serious question as to whether, given factors of distance, number of f facilities, where they're located, and so forth, whether Israel would even have that capability. So I, for one, would, uh, I'm not sure I would elevate uh, the one uh, u major unilateral and preemptive effort that the president uh, took uh, in Iraq to the level of, of doctrine. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, we'll have to see how history uh, treats this issue uh, over time. But I think it was a, a reaction to uh, the circumstances that arose after 9-11, possibly some legacy issues from having uh, the Bush 41 administration having uh, dealt uh, with, uh, uh, with Iraq uh, as well. Uh, but I think that uh, by the time the president had handed off power uh, to uh, his office to President Obama, I think you can point to a number of examples of where Mr. Obama felt very comfortable uh, carrying on the policies uh, that his, that, uh, his uh, pre predecessor had be bequeathed him. Thank you. I'm hoping by the time I've been hostile for 45 years that I'll finally find a microphone I can use. Uh, as a professor here, I want to welcome uh, Porter Goss and John Negroponte to come and be here today and uh, to express appreciation of your willingness to come here and talk about the issues. Um, I don't know that it's been openly acknowledged here, but the reality is that um, very few members of the administration have actually been willing to come here and talk about these issues, so I really especially appreciate your, your presence here. Um, some of you might have forgotten Dean Firestone's introduction, so in case there's any confusion, um, I want to make it 
clear that I am not now, nor have I ever been a member of the Bush administration. <laughs> I, I thought you might be confused about that. Um, I'm a historian at this university completing a book on Nixon administration. And before that, I wrote a very long book on the early Cold War. And for both of those projects, I spent, I, I wrote down hundreds, but it's actually thousands of hours reading top secret government documents. And these are records that are declassified 30 years after the fact. And, and reading all these documents has a lot of effects. It makes you seriously weird, for one thing. Um, but after a while, you read so many of these documents, and there's certain impressions that you get, the sort of meta impressions. Um, some of them pretty obvious. Uh, one is that uh, very often, public officials say things to the public that aren't true. And actually, I have to say, this is absurd for a professor, but sometimes I'm reading something in these documents that's secret, and then I look at, you know, President Nixon or uh, M Secretary Kissinger, and they come out, and they say the exact opposite of what they just said an hour ago. And I'm always amazed when this happens. So, so sometimes officials aren't truthful. Um, sometimes they exaggerate. Sometimes they deceive themselves. Sometimes presidents can be misled by advisors. But from reading all these documents, the most important thing, uh, impression that I've gotten, and I don't even, I've been struggling to how to articulate it, is that when you look at the deliberations of people at the very top levels, they use a language and have a way of talking through this sort of national security vernacular um, that has the effect of actually insulating them from the human reality that they're talking about. And that somehow that doesn't even enter the room. And you can read minutes of meetings and memos and so forth, and I've read them about Cambodia or Laos or South Vietnam or whatever it is. And what's happening in those places is like a million miles away from what's going on in those rooms. A million miles away, very little sense of what's happening. And, um, I, one of our speakers earlier was talking about, you know, uh, presidents at the top of his game. He has all the information that he needs to have. Uh, you know, uh, Bush was familiar with all the world leaders, so that's what he needed to know. Well, actually, I think Bush would have benefited from going to a village in Afghanistan, which we accidentally bombed, and talking to the people there. I think it actually would have been helpful for him and for our country if he'd seen it. But those deliberations at that high level has the effect of making those realities very obscure to the people who are sitting in those rooms. It also has the effect of generating a kind of grandiosity uh, by the people in those rooms, so, sort of a tendency to say things that are actually fairly simple and make them sound like they're profound. And I actually think uh, Ambassador Negroponte was getting at that with this idea of the Bush Doctrine, which really sounds like something phenomenal. Um, it's not exactly clear what it is, um, I tried to like look it up online. Um, a couple of ideas that were very important. One, the United States needs to be militarily stronger than every nation in the world. Two, that we retain the right to attack any country that does not expel people we consider dangerous. Three, that we need not be bound by the pressure of allies or the United Nations. Four, a threat does not have to be imminent for us to attack a country. Boiled down to its essentials, we are the world's only superpower, and we can do what we want. Now, this didn't originate with Bush. Um, actually, it goes back to 400 BC, um, when the Athenians spoke to the millions. Um, and they said in 400 BC to the poor millions, you know as well as we do that right as the world goes is only in question between equals in power while the strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. So my initial point, that's the Bush Doctrine, um, is that the Bush Doctrine is much less than, greets the, than meets the eye. A lot of old notions recycled for the 21st century. But that doesn't imply that it's meaningless. What it signaled was a newly aggressive, militarized foreign policy which came into its own after 9-11. Now we're told that's what the American public wanted. We're told there was bloodlust in the country. How brilliant of President Bush to stand in the middle of the rubble on ground zero with a bullhorn 
and yell, I can hear you, and soon the whole world will hear from us. But there was another choice on 9-11, and a different mood in New York City than the one is now portrayed. Now, I can't make generalizations about the whole United States, but what I can say is that I was in New York and in lower Manhattan during that entire time. The city of New York was still, it was sad, it was incredibly compassionate. Everywhere people were seeking to help one another. We'll hear about that bullhorn for eternity. But I want to just tell you a little story about my Brooklyn neighborhood, which was right across the river from the World Trade Center. Our streets and homes were covered in ashes, but we were a diverse neighborhood with Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And one week after the towers fell, the Arab American Family Support Network in our neighborhood reached out to a local synagogue and to my local peace group and proposed the candlelight vigil on the promenade to honor the dead, the first responders, and to pray for peace. It was organized very hurriedly, and it was unclear how many people would come. But when the moment arrived, hundreds of people came streaming down the street with their candles and their peace signs. So there wasn't even a place to stand. No bullhorn, peace signs. Now that sounds like the kind of corny thing a professor might bring up in contrast to the harsh realities of fighting terrorists out to destroy us. But to shift ground for a moment, in opting for war, in invading Iraq and Afghanistan, creating secret prisons in locations around the world, ignoring the Geneva Conventions, torturing detainees in sites around the world. There was nothing very realistic about how the Bush administration responded to 9-11. Keeping us safe from terrorism, we all think that that's important. But to illustrate the choices that were made, I'm going to make another little professor's story. I want to talk about firehouses, the ones in my neighborhood just across the river from the World Trade Center. The trucks were called in right from the beginning of the attack. They drove across the Brooklyn Bridge and they rushed into burning buildings and helped to save hundreds of lives. Many of our firemen died when those buildings collapsed, which actually included one of my friends. And then what happened a year later was that our firehouse closed because there was no money in New York City to pay for all the firehouses. I didn't have enough money to keep them open. Meanwhile, the Bush administration was sending millions of dollars to Iraq in suitcases for which there was never any accounting. The unbelievable sloppiness in handling this money, millions disappearing into Iraq, millions to pay warlords in Afghanistan, millions to private contractors for schools never built and hospitals never finished and soldiers housing's not quite safe but not enough money for firehouses and frankly not enough for our veterans health services either what does that say about our national priorities what does that say about keeping america safe whatever it exactly meant the bush doctrine found its culmination in the war in iraq a war of choice with a country that had nothing to do with 9-11 for the purpose of saving us from weapons of mass destruction, which turned out didn't exist. This episode is now described as a mistake, a failure of intelligence. Stuff happens, said Donald Rumsfeld. We didn't know the weapons weren't there. We didn't know the invasion and occupation would cost so many lives. We didn't know we would spend more than a trillion dollars to pacify this piece, the place. People make mistakes. But in this instance, many of the things were knowable. People did know these things. There were weapons inspectors in Iraq saying, wait, there might be nothing here. There were military people saying, we can't run an operation like this on a shoestring. There were Middle East experts saying over and over, if you try, to occupy this country, it will be a disaster. But these warnings were ignored. And those kinds of people who said those kinds of things never made it into the stuffy room where military realism prevailed. And so, can I get some water? This cheerful talk. Thank you. And so the result. 
of what are the results of this realistic choice, or I would say unrealistic choice. According to the Watson Institute at Brown University, Iraq has already cost us $1.7 trillion, with an additional $490 billion owed to our war veterans. We've killed 135,000 Iraq civilians, I'm saying we, that 100, I shouldn't say we, I should say that the war killed at least 135,000 Iraq civilians. As many as 5 million Iraqis were driven from their homes. By any calculus, the decision to invade Iraq can be counted among the most disastrous in modern history. And I have to say, it's a little bit incredible to me to hear about what a great customer of intelligence was President Bush in the context of the truly disastrous decisions that he made with the horrendous human cost that was involved. One last story. On September 12, 2001, rescue workers at Ground Zero pulled out Janelle Guzma, age 30. She was the last person to be saved from that devastation. And while most of you are too young to remember, um, as those last people were pulled from the rubble, it was an incredible moment. Somebody was saved, one person was saved. And people wept when they pulled that one person out of the rubble. And why was that? Because one of the things we learned on 9-11 is that every single person's life is important and precious. And that points to the tragic legacy of the Bush doctrine. Bush doc a Bush administration which was so profligate about the taking of human life, whether it be Afghans or Iraqis or our own soldiers, the unbelievable ways the Bush administration never caught Osama bin Laden, but it did immense damage. And we are still living with that now. And the responsibility for these mistakes no longer rests with us up here, but it rests with all of us in the audience. Because if we forget or minimize the gravity of the mistakes that we made over those years, we will continue to make those mistakes on into the future, and many, many, many more people will die. Thank you. Well, I too would like to thank uh, Hofstra for hosting this very important conference and uh, appreciate you all for coming today. Uh, let me just begin by saying that the accusation that President Bush abused his power and presided over a lawless administration, which is frequently leveled against this president, um, is certainly nothing new for partisans on both sides of the proverbial excuse me, proverbial displays of hypocrisy regarding presidential power, will tend to criticize the sitting president, whether he's uh, a member of their party or not, or excuse me, on, on partisan grounds. So, you know, putting that aside, um, I would say that George W. Bush has been subjected to uh, some of the worst demagoguery, uh, and it, unfortunately it comes from a number of my scholarly comrades, especially historians, and law professors who consider themselves experts on the presidency. And I find this uh, particularly disturbing uh, in that historians especially are supposed to wait for documents to come out. They're supposed to wait for oral history interviews to be conducted. Uh, they're supposed to wait for memoirs from both domestic political figures and foreign political leaders as well. And they're supposed to do the unsexy work of going through an archive and spending lots of quiet time looking at, at boring documents. Unfortunately, far too many historians abandon any pretense of objectivity and seemed unwilling to place George W. Bush's actions into historical context. Uh, and I'm talking about historians, by the way, who are pronouncing in 2005 or 2006 that the Bush presidency was already an epic disaster and one of the worst presidents in history, and he was one of the worst presidents in history. Now, I know I'm not standing up here saying that George W. Bush was a great president by any stretch. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, the economic collapse, the war in Iraq. Uh, there are a number of issues that need to be put into the equation when assessing a presidency. Uh, but at the very least, it struck me that my scholarly comrades had an obligation to wait until a presidency was over before proclaiming it as one of the worst ever. And I would even argue that here we are five, six, seven years out, 
it's still very early to make sweeping judgments about any presidency. And just as a reminder, uh, at this point after Harry Truman's departure from the White House, he was still a remarkably unpopular figure. And certainly in scholarly circles, at this point after Dwight Eisenhower's departure from the presidency, Eisenhower's was considered a rank mediocrity. Uh, nonetheless, this conventional anti-Bush narrative, uh, which also sometimes suggests that Vice President Cheney was actually pulling the strings, which is a myth, um, uh, you know, persists to this day, and it persists among people who, who should know better. And again, I'm referring to my fellow scholars who uh, have avoided the hard work of history in terms of doing some actual digging as opposed to reading the op-ed page of the New York Times. Um, curiously, many of the same scholars who have condemned George W. Bush as a lawless presidency celebrate the presidencies of John F. Kennedy, whose administration wiretapped Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and plotted the assassination of Fidel Castro. Uh, they also, many of these folks, not all, there is some consistency there, but it's the exception. Uh, they've also celebrated the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt, who used the Federal Bureau of Investigation as his private detective agency, and who tried an American citizen in a military tribunal that hastily dispatched the defendant to the electric chair. To make matters worse, uh, many of my fellow activist scholars abandoned the precepts of their craft, as I said before, by pronouncing this judgment prior to examining a single document or conducting a solitary interview. I think this deep scholarly animosity towards President Bush and Vice President Cheney was the result of the fact that Bush was the first president to face a serious challenge to America's security since the enactment of a new regime of post-Watergate, post-Vietnam reforms designed to curb the imperial presidency. These reforms had the effect of enhancing the power of Congress and the courts to check the executive, and in concert with an adversarial media and a skeptical scholarly community, produced a kind of permanent hostility to executive secrecy, as Alexander Hamilton called it, secrecy and dispatch. Since the founding of the nation, the courts and Congress have deferred to the executive branch on these issues, but that tradition began to erode in the 1960s and 70s, rightly so in many cases, as the courts expanded their role in the national security arena. And the courts would frequently ally themselves with Congress in order to check the executive branch. So in a sense, Bush and Cheney tried to play by the old rules, by the pre Watergate pre-church committee rules. And as of 2014, we can at least say that they appear to have lost in their effort to kind of restore the system back to its pre-Frank Church, pre-Watergate committee mode. But I would just warn you that history can be fickle. And at least in regards to Bush's war on terror, I believe that someday they will become to be seen in more favorable light as partisan passions cool. Um, I don't expect that to occur fast. Uh, I don't ever expect the Bush, for Bush to sort of emerge in that top 10 list of presidential greatness, where, by the way, Harry Truman resides. And if we want to talk about torture, we could have a very lengthy debate over the Truman administration's use of hundreds, if not thousands, of ex-members of the SS as intelligence sources in dealing with the new Cold War. So if we're going to look at cases of waterboarding, uh, if we're going to look at rendition, we also then need to do history justice and re-examine the presidencies of Harry Truman, for instance, or JFK, or any number of progressive presidents who, unfortunately, are frequently cut a lot of slack by my fellow academics precisely because they are progressive presidents. They are not conservative presidents. Uh, George W. Bush's low standing, I believe, among academics, my fellow academics, reflects in part the rise of partisan scholarship, uh, the use of history as ideology and as a political weapon, which in my view means the corruption of history as history. Again, I don't believe that George W. Bush was a great president. In fact, he's probably going to come out at some point either as a below average or average president. 
But the conventional wisdom regarding the presidency of George W. Bush, I believe, is misguided. And a revisionist account of this presidency, at least in regards to his national security policies, is overdue. And I'll just leave you with this. We're not too far from the World Trade Center site. Put yourself in Bush's position or in his seat on 9-12. Put 9-11 aside for a minute. Put yourself in Bush's seat on 9-12 and ask what, what you would have done. Uh, I know what he did, either that day or the next, he told his FBI director and his attorney general to do whatever it took to make sure that this did not happen again. Um, and I have to say, had I been in that seat, I probably would have said the same thing. Thank you. was clearly a defining moment, a horrific moment when close to 3,000 people were incinerated in an instant. The question though was, what did Iraq have to do with 9-11? If you ask yourself as the last speaker suggested, what would you have done on September 12th? Why would you attack a country that had nothing to do with this horrific attack on the United States. Just today, a report has come out from the Nobel Prize winning International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. They've done some calculations. They released a report saying this investigation comes to the conclusion that the war has directly or indirectly killed around one million people in Iraq, 220,000 in Afghanistan, 80,000 in Pakistan, a total of around 1.3 million. Not included in this figure are further war zones such as Yemen. The figure is approximately 10 times greater than that of which the public, experts, and decision makers are aware of and propagated by the media and major NGOs. And this is only a conservative estimate, they write. The total number of deaths in the three countries named above could also be in excess of two million, whereas a figure below one million is extremely unlikely. One million deaths in Iraq in the last bit more than a decade. In a country, the Bush administration said they were going to save. That would, as they famously said, Cheney and Rumsfeld greet US soldiers with flowers and sweets. As Vice President Cheney said, we are going to liberate the people of Iraq. Sadly, the Bush administration exploited 9-11. The blueprint for what happened, and I think it's important to go back, even not so far in history, was drawn up years earlier by the Project for the New American Century. I'm reading from my first book, um, The Exception to the Rulers. That was called PNAC. Uh, think Tank formed in 1997 to, quote, promote American global leadership, unquote. Its founders are a who's who of the neoconservative movement, which seamlessly morphed into the top officialdom of the Bush II administration. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, Vice President Dick Cheney, Cheney's Chief of Staff L. Scooter Libby, Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, Defense Policy Board member Richard Pearl, National Security Council staff member Elliot Abrams, among others. The PNAC members had a reputation around Washington, explained Ray McGovern, a retired CIA analyst with 27 years experience. As Mr. Goff and Negroponte were talking about the presidential daily brief, uh, yes, Ray McGovern was one of those CIA analysts. He did it for Vice President George H.W. Bush. But he observed, when we saw these people, he's talking about the PNAC members, Coming back in town, all of us said, oh my God, the crazies are back. McGovern said their wild-eyed geopolitical schemes would typically go right into the circular file. 
In September 2000, PNAC issued a report that called upon the United States to dominate global resources. The key to realizing this was, quote, some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. And so you have the allegations of weapons of mass destruction and Iraq itself, the pretext for a larger scheme. According to PNAC, while the unresolved conflict with Iraq provides the immediate justification, the need for a substantial American force presence in the Gulf transcends the issue of the regime of Saddam Hussein. And so on the morning of September 12, 2001, Donald Rumsfeld reacted to the World Trade Center and Pentagon attacks by declaring to Bush's cabinet that the United States should immediately attack Iraq. It didn't matter then or later that Iraq had no connection to Al-Qaeda or the 9-11 attacks. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice told senior National Security Council staff, quote, to think about how do you capitalize on these opportunities. She compared the situation with 1945 to 1945 to 1947, the start of the Cold War. But not all people in the National Security Council felt the way that those administration officials did. Take Richard Clark. He'd advised oh, President Reagan and George H.W. Bush on counterterrorism. He was carried over to George W. Bush's administration, his counterterrorism czar, and also was with President Clinton. He was shocked when Rumsfeld, the day after, said, we've got to look at Iraq. He was shocked when President Bush told him to look at Iraq. Uh, one of the things he told CBS is 60 Minutes, I think when talking about President Bush, I think he's done a terrible job against, uh, on the war against terrorism. Because he said months before the 9-11 attacks, he had warned the administration, we've got to look at Al-Qaeda. But to be told the day after the 9-11 attacks, you must look at Iraq? And think about it today. One million Iraqis dead. But the Bush administration didn't do it alone. They had a compliant press to amplify their allegations, the falsehood. And that also has to be looked at. During the years of the Bush administration, where was the press? The White House propaganda blitz was launched on September 7, 2002 at a Camp David press conference. British Prime Minister Tony Blair stood side by side with President George W. Bush. Together they declared that evidence from a report published by the UN International Atomic Energy Agency showed that Iraq was six months away from building nuclear weapons. President Bush said, I don't know what more evidence we need. Actually, any evidence would have helped. There was no such IAEA report, but at the time, few mainstream American journalists questioned the leader's outright lies. Instead, the following day, so-called evidence popped up in the Sunday New York Times under the twin byline of Michael Gordon and Judith Miller. They wrote, more than a decade after Saddam Hussein agreed to give up weapons of mass destruction, Iraq has stepped up its quest for nuclear weapons and has embarked on a worldwide hunt for materials to make an atomic bomb. This according to Bush administration officials, they wrote. In a revealing example of how the story amplified administration spin, the authors included the phrase, soon to be repeated by President Bush and all his top officials, the first sign of a smoking gun, administration officials argue, may be a mushroom cloud. Harper's publisher, John MacArthur, author of Second Front, Censorship and Propaganda in the Gulf War, knew what to make of this front page bombshell. He wrote, in a disgraceful piece of stenography, he wrote, Gordon and Miller inflated an administration leak into something resembling imminent Armageddon. The Bush administration knew just what to do with the story they had fed to Gordon and Miller. The day the Times story ran, Vice President Dick Cheney made the rounds of the Sunday talk shows to advance the administration's bogus claims. On NBC's Meet the Press, Cheney declared that Iraq had purchased aluminum tubes to make enriched uranium. It didn't matter that the IAEA refuted the charge both before and after it was made. But Cheney did not want viewers just to take his word for it. 
He said, there's a story in the New York Times this morning, and I want to attribute the Times, he said. This was the classic disinformation two-step. The White House leaks a lie to the Times, the newspaper publishes it as a startling expose, and then the White House conveniently masquerades behind the credibility of the New York Times. What mattered, wrote MacArthur, was the unencumbered rollout for a commercial for war. What matters now is that we had a media in this country that acted as a conveyor belt for the lies. And why does that matter? Is it just an academic exercise? Because the lies took and are taking lives. And that's what we have to look at. But not all in the press were complicit. There were many on the front lines who were trying their hardest to get out the truth on the ground in Iraq. Which takes us to the moment the day before the US Marines pulled down the statue of Saddam Hussein in Firdos Square. It was April 8th, 2003. Um, you had a young reporter who had just joined Al Jazeera in their, Cairo off in their uh, Baghdad offices. He went on the roof to set the camera. And he was killed when US helicopter strafed the building. Across the street, Abu Dhabi TV, the hosts were shouting on the air, help us, as they were being strafed. Within a few hours, the Palestine Hotel became a target for the US military. Now, all knew at that time that the Palestine Hotel in Baghdad was where well over 100 unembedded journalists were staying. And they were working hard. When the Abrams tank set their sights on the hotel and opened fire, they killed two reporters. Taras Protsyuk of Reuters was on his balcony filming what was happening. It would about to be the fall of Baghdad. He was with Reuters. And then there was Jose Coso on another balcony, also filming for Telecinco in Spain. Both of them were immediately killed, and many others were wounded on that day. That was April 8, 2003. Then you come to the summer. This is the summer of 2003. Mazandana, another Reuters videographer, one of their finest, was outside what would later become world famous, Abu Ghraib, but not yet. He was there with a sound man covering what was happening. They talked to US soldiers, but within minutes, he filmed his own death as the US soldiers attacked him. The sound men said, we'd just been speaking with the soldiers. Later, a Pentagon spokesperson would say they accidentally, quote, engaged a cameraman. Take this forward to the beginning, January of 2004. Remember Eason Jordan? He was the head of CNN. Well, he was inadvertently caught on a microphone at the World Economic Forum saying the US military had targeted a dozen journalists who'd been killed in Iraq. There was a great firestorm, um, and ultimately he resigned after 23 years at CNN, not wanting CNN to become a target. Journalists targeted in Iraq, and those are the journalists. Now I want to talk about the whistleblowers the very brave people who step forward, for example, soldiers who were horrified by what they saw. While the New York Times very much paved the way for war, they also published a few very good op-ed pieces, like Jamil Jaffer and Larry Seam's piece, honoring those who said no. They began in January 2004, specialist Joseph M. Darby a 24-year-old army reservist in Iraq discovered a set of photographs showing other members of his company torturing prisoners at the Abu Ghraib prison. The discovery anguished him, and he struggled over how to respond. He recalled later, I had the choice between what I knew was morally right and my loyalty to other soldiers. I couldn't have it both ways, he said. So he copied the photographs onto a CD, sealed it in an envelope, and delivered the envelope and an anonymous letter to the Army's Criminal Investigation Command. Three months later, seven years ago today, they wrote, the photographs were published. Specialist Darby soon found himself the target of death threats, but he had no regrets. 
testifying at a pretrial hearing for a fellow soldier, he said that the abuse, quote, violated everything I personally believed in and all I'd been taught about the rules of war. Yes, there are many brave people, people on the ground, soldiers, journalists, who did speak out. Cy Hirsch, who published those photos in the New Yorker, said, and they were horrific, said, you actually haven't seen the worst of them yet. So now let's talk about what Mr. Goff and Mr. Negroponte didn't talk about, the word torture. There is no doubt torture played a major role in the push for invading Iraq. And while the Senate report and other critics say torture produced false information that could have been one of the program's goals, in 2009, McClatchy reported the Bush administration applied relentless pressure on interrogators to use harsh methods on detainees in part to find evidence of cooperation between al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein's regime. A former senior U.S. intelligence official said, quote, there was constant pressure on the intelligence agencies and the interrogators to do whatever it took to get that information out of the detainees, especially the few high value ones we had. And when people kept coming up empty, they were told by Cheney's and Rumsfeld's people to push harder, this person, this person said. The Iraq torture connection gets only bare mention in the Senate intelligence report, the executive summary which was released in uh, December. But it's still significant. In a footnote, the report cites the case of Ibn Sheikh al-Libi. After US forces sent him for torture in Egypt, Libby made up the false claim that Iraq provided training in chemical and biological weapons to al-Qaeda. Secretary of State Colin Powell then used Libby's statement in his famous February 5th, 2003 address to the UN Security Council, an address he would later call a stain on his career. That speech at the UN falsely alleging Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction. The Senate report says, quote, Libby later recanted the claim, claiming he'd been tortured and only told them what he assessed that they wanted to hear. Torture. It is so important to talk about this today. What has gone on and who should be held accountable. The Senate Intelligence Report, the executive order was, the executive summary was released in December and it covered between 2002 and 2006. Even Senator John McCain, well, a man who himself was tortured in captivity as a POW in Vietnam, called for its release. Graphic new details of the post 9-11 US torture program came to light in December when the Senate Intelligence Committee released that 500 page summary of its investigation into the CIA with key parts redacted. The report concludes that the intelligence agency failed to disrupt a single plot despite torturing Al Qaeda and other captives in secret prisons worldwide between 2002 and six, and details a list of torture methods used on prisoners, including waterboarding, sexual threats with broomsticks, medically unnecessary rectal feeding. The report also confirms the CIA ran black sites in Afghanistan, Lithuania, Romania, Poland, Thailand, and a secret site on the Guantanamo Naval Base known as Strawberry Fields. So far, no one involved in the CIA interrogation program has been charged with a crime except for the whistleblower, John Kiriakou, who just came out of two years of prison and is currently under house arrest. Well, it is so important to assess the Bush administration, and I hope in a few years you'll be doing the same for the Obama administration as you've done and as you have done in the past. Should President Bush, Vice President Cheney, oh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld and CIA officials be tried for torture? That is a very serious question. 
A human rights group in Berlin has filed a criminal complaint against the architects of the Bush administration's torture program. It's called the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, accusing former Bush administration officials like CIA Director George Tenet and Donald Rumsfeld of war crimes, calling for an immediate investigation by a German prosecutor, the move following the release of the Senate report. But it is not only international law groups that are calling for this. Yes, President Bush's own counterterrorism czar, Richard Clark, has called for the same. I want to congratulate Hofstra for holding this assessment of the Bush administration. But I think now it has to go beyond assessment. And this is to a larger audience in this country and around the world. If we really care about national security and being a model for the world of justice. It has to move from assessment to an accounting and to accountability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would any of our panelists like to comment on any of the presentations that were made? I would just, uh, is this on? No, it's not on. Can I hear? No. We're okay now. I uh, just simply, uh, in the interest of uh, fairness, would re respond a little bit on the Senate Select uh, Committee on Intelligence study on uh, rendition, detention, and interrogation was a partisan political study. It was not two-sided, and there are further facts that need to come out uh, from those who are able to, I think, correct some of the misstatements in the Senate study. That has not happened yet. I hope it will happen because I do believe the American public needs to know the truth uh, of all of this. The Senate study is not the full truth. Was there any truth in it? Okay. Was there any truth in it? Of course there was some truth in it. Um, th it was a cherry-picked, selective presentation of information to support a narrative that was made before this report actually even was started. The announced purpose of the report, of the study, if I'm correcting uh, Chairman Feinstein, if I'm quoting Chairman Feinstein properly, was to make sure this never happens again. Uh, I'm not sure what the this was, and neither are a lot of people, but apparently, as you go through the report, as you go through this study, there are a series of observations uh, that involve information that the decision makers could have provided uh, to the people doing the report and would have given a fairer and more complete understanding of what happened and why. If you want to know why something happened, it's a good idea to go back to the people who made the decision and ask them. They calculatedly and determinedly avoided going back to anybody that they thought might spoil their narrative. So consequently, yes, there is some information that is cherry-picked, some out of context, and some actually uh, factually correct as far as I know. I have not read a word of the report. 
I have not read a word of any of this stuff because to me it is purely partisan political and the politicization of intelligence in this country is going to hurt only one person and that's every citizen in the United States. I just wanted to quote um, Senator McCain. Who I, I love Senator McCain and I would certainly agree with you that Senator McCain is the icon of a prisoner of war um, conduct. Uh, he has suffered greatly for our country and made great sacrifices and deserves to be listened to, but he does not have all of the information either. He said, it is a thorough and thoughtful study of practices that I believe not only failed their purpose to secure actionable intelligence to prevent further attacks on the U.S. and our allies, but actually damaged our security interests as well as our reputation as a force for good in the world. He is welcome to his opinion. I doubt he's read the report. And in any event, he has certainly not asked the people who were involved uh, in this activity what they think. Uh, because they have all indicated that he has not asked them. So uh, even he is dealing with less than a full deck. Ambassador? Did you? Uh, well, yeah, I, th I think I'd love to hear some questions from, from the audience. But I would recall, for those of you who might not have been here this morning, uh, and Peter Baker, I thought, put it well. And, and it's a point I made in my initial presentation that the administration was a dynamic one. It evolved. Uh, there were certain behaviors that occurred in the early part of the administration. Baker talked about waterboarding and uh, said yes, uh, but the last case of waterboarding was in 2003. Uh, Mr. Goss took his job in 2004. I did in 2005. This was an evolving situation. About my point about the president being a good customer of intelligence. Let's uh, remember that they, the, neither Mr. Powell nor President Bush, but Mr. Powell did not deliberately mislead the Security Council when he made that presentation in February of 2003. I was sitting right behind him with George Tennant. He believed it in good faith. It turned out that the source uh, who should not have been believed, and this was a real intelligence failure, mm -hmm. uh, had deliberately deceived uh, his handlers and deliberately said that fabricated the information that Iraq had WMD uh, because he was an Iraqi source and I think they found out later on that he was wanted us to do exactly what we did in the wake uh, of his testimony and that of others. So. This was an intelligent fa failure, and it led to uh, significant intelligence reform, but neither Bush nor Mr. Powell uh, uh, were trying to mislead anybody. They believed that intelligence themselves and were very deceived by the fact uh, that it turned out to be false. The last point I'd like to make is that I know this is a talk about the Bush Doctrine and counterterrorism, but I do think we want to keep into perspective that the foreign policy of the Bush administration ranged uh, over a, an enormous variety uh, of issues, whether it's the free trade agreements that uh, the president accomplished, uh, his uh, policy towards Africa and the uh, PEPFAR program to uh, save people from uh, the effects of the HIV AIDS virus, his strategic uh, uh, move towards India, uh, establishing relations with the country of India that were uh, unprecedented in recent decades between the United States and India, uh, and his outreach to China, People's Republic of China as well. So just remember, um, presidents have a very uh, full plate in addition to, of course, their domestic responsibilities. And I would say that uh, over time, it's not gonna happen uh, today or tomorrow, but over time, I think that President Bush is going to be evaluated for the entirety of his foreign policy uh, and not just uh, the uh, war on terror and the two wars in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. Uh, Mr. Goss and Dr. Eisenberg. 
I believe you had your hand up before. No, I was just going to say that uh, if, if those who uh, remember that era of uh, 2001 and two, when we were talking about weapons of mass destruction, the conventional wisdom was they were there. And it wasn't, wasn't just something that was manufactured, it was every intelligence organization on a global basis with whom the networks were uh, talking to each other. Uh, and there was uh, a, a lot of different information coming from a lot of different sectors. It was all a little bit sort of wifty information. Uh, there were some things that were pretty clear. Uh, one of, I think it was uh, Saddam Hussein's sons had come out and given some information and then gone back and I think was summarily executed at some point. Mm -hmm. that, I think that's correct. I'm, been a while since I remembered all this. But uh, I remember uh, the celebrated moment was when Director Tennant uh, had announced to the, to the president this was a slam dunk. Yes, of course they had weapons of mass destruction. And uh, I don't believe anybody was intentionally misleading anybody. What I said was our intelligence wasn't up to snuff because we had hollowed out our capacity after, uh, as part of the peace dividend. And, and the fact that we didn't have the best information is sad, and it led to tragic consequences in, in a number of cases, I am sure. But we did learn the lesson, and the lesson was rebuild our intelligence community, which is what we're trying to do. But it will never work if we politicize for partisan gain or some other agenda the facts and, and try and tell only as part of the narrative rather than the whole narrative. And that's my beef for the Senate study. All right, is that working? You know, I have to say, I almost want to laugh when we talk about the politicization of, of information. <coughs> it is certainly well known and well understood by this time that Vice President Cheney, not once, not twice, not five times, not seven times, went to the CIA headquarters and pressured them to come up with a certain result. And if that's not politicization of intelligence, I don't know what is. So I think it's very important that we keep that in mind. And again, particularly because that pressure on that agency and other agencies of government you know, led to policies that proved to be enormously costly for other people. I don't want to uh, spend a huge amount of time about you know, who lied, who didn't know, whatever. I would say that if the President of the United States turns to the Director of CIA and asks if the intelligence really is, is reliable, and the CIA guy says it's a slam dunk, okay, and that's persuasive, I don't necessarily feel like that is the most intelligent uh, a consumption of information on the part of a president. I actually think it would have been important for George Bush to ask more questions than that. But to go beyond all of this, a thing that I think, and I think Ambassador Negroponte alluded to this, a thing to keep in mind is that there were weapons inspectors in Iraq, that because of the UN resolution which you helped to to get through, Saddam Hussein in those last months admitted weapons inspectors into his country without restriction. And there were inspectors going there from the International uh, Atomic Energy Commission. There were other inspectors under Hans Blix that were looking for chemical and biological weapons. El Baraday from the nu nuclear side said they found no evidence of Saddam Hussein restoring a nuclear capability, any effort, no nuclear program, none. Hans Blix was less sure, right? but he went many, many places. And just remember, Rumsfeld and Cheney kept saying over and over, we know where these weapons are, right? We know where they're, not just them, we know where they are. So here are these UN inspectors, they're presumably in communication with Americans who know where these weapons are. Weeks are going by, and they're not finding anything. And you're the President of the United States. And you're being told by two teams of weapons inspectors, either definitely not, or we don't seem to be finding it, give us more time. And instead of responding to Hans Blix in that way, who says, we're not finding anything, get us more time, 
and as international support is eroding with every day because people are becoming more and more suspicious about whether they're really there, instead of doing that, the president decides to invade. So whether or not the CIA did its job or not, the question still is, why didn't the President of the United States, if he wanted to avoid a war, why didn't he listen to the UN teams? I think it's time for us to take some questions from the audience. So uh, what, what I would ask, what I would ask, uh, I think there's a microphone, somebody's holding a microphone, right, that it will go around to if you raise your hand. Okay, and when you, when you uh, ask your question, if you want to direct it toward one of the panelists, just indicate which of the panelists. And if it's a general question you're throwing out, uh, then uh, it'll be up to one of the panelists to take that question. Please remember, we're here to ask questions and not to make statements. I believe you had your hand up all the way back there. Yes, you, <laughs> that's right. Where's the microphone, okay. Uh, this question's for, this question's for uh, Professor Knott. You mentioned um, what would you do if you were in the scenario, in his scenario on September 12th, but what about from January to uh, September 10th when he ignored the numerous warnings from the intelligence agencies? I think that's the more important question to ask. What would you do in those days leading up to it? Yeah, I, you know, I think um, Bush, both Presidents Bush and Clinton deserve some criticism for not giving the threat from Al Qaeda the priority it was due. Now, I know that Richard Clark would disagree. He says that the Clinton administration did focus on Al Qaeda. But, you know, Al Qaeda declared war on the United States in 1996. They repeated that declaration in 98. Uh, in the meantime, you had the two embassy bombings in Africa in 98. You had the USS Cole in the fall of 2000. Uh, you had other events where Al Qaeda was, you know, kept increasing the intensity of their attacks. So there's plenty of blame to go around, in my view. Uh, both President Clinton and President Bush in that interim period uh, did not give Al-Qaeda al the attention it was due. Uh, and to be perfectly honest, I think they failed in a very critical role, which the President has to play, which is to educate the American public. And again, the fact was this group was uh, determined to strike the United States and kept escalating. And how, look how many Americans were surprised when 9-11 happened. That shouldn't have happened. Shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody. Okay, could I ask a question on, uh, of Director Goff and Mr. Negroponte, rather of Mr. Negroponte. Mr. Goff, just a quick question. Mr. <laughs> Goff said, if we knew then what we know today, we might have done things differently, which I think is a very reasonable thing to say. Thank you. Do you think that, Mr. Negroponte, that yeah. knowing what we know today, the Iraq War was wrong, and do you think that torture is wrong? Look, uh, well, torture is never right. Do you yeah. think the Bush it administration was, uh, was wrong to engage in I, it? I say torture is never right. That's my first point. But, but my second point was, I'll just stick with the way I felt during the time I lived through those events. And you can find quotes of what I said when I was ambassador to the UN. I, I was asked if I thought we should use force in Iraq. And I said, well, in questions like this, uh, I think we ought to approach the issue with a great deal of caution. I also said that we ought to, uh, and I felt, that we ought to allow the inspection process uh, more time to do its work. I was disappointed that it wasn't allowed. But you know, you have one president at a time. He's the commander in chief, he's got the constitutional authority, and that's what he decided to do. The last point I would make to your uh, issue about Hans Blix and Mohammed el Baradai. Uh, Blix and I had a chance to reminisce about this a little bit later on, and I said to him, it's amazing, you know, we, we've set up this inspection thing and we never found anything and, uh, you know, what the heck happened? And Blix said, you know, it's, it's, that's right. But he said, I can't, I still don't understand why Saddam behaved so guilty. <laughs> and maybe that's why he had some doubt. Because he was, uh, he, he, Saddam sort of emitted, emanated this sort of sensation that he had, that he was hiding something. Now, some people have speculated, and I think it was an FBI agent who had interviewed him extensively, that actually he wanted some people to think that he had WMD in his neighborhood. 
in the wake of the iran iraq war and so that that maybe this was part of of his strategy but it kind of if if indeed it was his strategy it boomerang next question from the audience uh, yes during your time as ambassador because Amy Goodman exposed the role of uh, the U.S., uh, this uh, Mr. Steele in training death squads and torturers within the Iraqi security forces. So I'm wondering if anything was done on your part to crack down on that. And the second question is, and that could be part of the dark legacy, that the U.S. was associated with some very vicious elements in Iraq. Your thoughts on that. And the second element, uh, a question was, you, you were talking about other elements of Bush's foreign policy. Do you consider Plan Columbia a great success? Because we know there was great human rights abuses of the Colombian military, murders by paramilitaries that the U.S. And that's been the model for the Plan Merida in Mexico. So uh, is that a success? And also, what about the U.S. support for the Congo War? You mentioned Africa. And we know, yes, I think I agree that the AIDS initiative was very positive, but what about the U.S. role in supporting the Rwandan and Ugandan militaries and their plunder of Congo and the five million deaths uh, that occurred in Congo? Is that a success? Well, I think that probably we don't have time to go through all of these uh, issues exhaustively, but I think that the, the thought that Colonel Steele was training death squads in uh, Iraq is utter nonsense. Uh, and certainly our objective when I was ambassador there was to stand up a professional national army. And I consider that a priority <coughs> objective. Obviously we've had mixed, our success at best uh, until now has been mixed. But that was, that was the uh, objective. On Colombia, on Colombia, all I would tell you, if, if, if I think you mentioned Colombia, uh, uh, Plan Colombia has been a great success. It was started by Bill Clinton it was pursued by George uh, W. Bush, and Colombia is a democratic uh, country. It's had a series of democratic elections, and the country is a lot more secure and safe than it was before. You know, war, war is hell. We know that. Um, but I think that uh, the C President Uribe and Santos after him both approached uh, the conflict uh, with uh, democratic ideals in mind. They were, not, they were not trying to be dictators, and they were not trying to behave in some kind of a bestial way. They were trying to win the security of their country, but preserve its democratic framework. Yes. Hi. Uh, this question is really for Mr. Goss or just about anyone. Actually, from after the post-invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, there were these like massive bloodshed within the civilian population because of the brewing insurgency. Why did it take, why did it take the, uh, the Bush administration so long to realize that there, they had an insurgency in Iraq, and why did they fail to protect the civilian population? I, I suspect maybe the ambassador has a better key on Iraq than I do, but my answer to that would be uh, simply the situation in Iraq evolved rather quickly uh, from what we thought was going to be the desired result or what some thought the policymakers thought was going to be the desired result, that as somebody said, flowers were going to be strewn and our soldiers were going to be greeted. Well, it turned out that we didn't really have that. We had sort of a pro-council out there and then we had an ambassador who uh, brought things along. The, the process, uh, while we were trying to build democracy in Iraq, there were people in nearby countries and in nearby groups trying to destabilize Iraq and trying to make sure that those, those uh, er efforts to plant seeds of democracy did not succeed. And I would give you Iran as a case in point. We're killing our soldiers or providing the equipment to kill our soldiers. Uh, while at the same time we were trying to bring the democratic uh, institutions to bear and set up uh, friendships between people who weren't friendly to share the power of the country in a system that would look like uh, a potential way to bring forward change in government in the future without violence and bloodshed. 
the problem is we're dealing with something that's been going on since 640 AD, uh, if not longer, if you take in the condition of humanity, and uh, these folks uh, still are trying to settle a score. We withdrew, a vacuum took place, the surge worked for a while, we left, we didn't have status of a force agreement, look what we've got today, we have ISIL. Would we have had ISIL 12 years sooner if we had never gone to Iraq? Fair question to ask. All the way in the back, on the right, yes, you. Hi. Um, my question is, somebody refer made a reference to sort of historians rushing to judgment about George W. Bush. Um, it's sort of, it's, yeah, right. It's, it's not my place to, how true that is. My question is then, going forward, how possible is it, will it be to do real work, research-wise, history-wise, when so much of the information is demonized? I, I think of the Iraq war logs. Uh, as an example, um, so that, yeah, that's my question. So much of the history, I'm sorry, I missed the word you used. So much of the history is what? Is de demonized. Demonized. Demon oh, oh. Well, uh, I'm not a professional archivist. I know we have the director of the Bush Library here. I'm sure he can answer your question for you, but uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure what you mean by demonized unless you're talking about uh, leakers who are still within the government and then decide to, you know, follow Edward Snowden's path or whatever. You're correct. There are people who demonize them. The point being that if you're a presidential historian, a good one will tell you you've got to wait at least 20 years because you have to let the passions cool. You have to do the spade work. Now, the problem is even worse than you suggested because nobody puts anything down in writing anymore, which is a point that was made earlier today in one of the first panels because they're afraid of getting a subpoena even from, <laughs> either from Capitol Hill or from some special prosecutor that's created. So the historical record, unfortunately, is riddled with holes that go well beyond what you just said. But I, I would still make the case that if you're a presidential historian, uh, like, uh, I mean, God rest his soul, Arthur Schlesinger claimed in 2005 that George W. Bush was one of the worst presidents in American history. And in fact, what the Bush-Cheney administration was attempting to do was to create a system of world domination. I mean, that's just, that's editorializing without evidence. Right. Next question, please. Uh, by the way, I'll take this opportunity. Two of our panelists have to leave right now. Uh, and um, I just want to thank them on behalf of Hofstra for coming here today and participating. But we still have a, a few. We still have a few minutes ahead of us, and uh, let's take any other questions that are. That, uh, yes, y your student over here. Um, so, Professor Knott, you said that with the events leading up to 9/11, we should have taken more account and like put more focus on the event, like the threat of Afghanistan. So, do you believe that well, the with threat ISIL of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan? Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you believe that now with ISIL, we should be putting more focus on them, or, we, or should we handle the situation any differently than we are? Uh, look, I'm, I'm not trying to be evasive. I just, even though I teach at a war college, that's not my specialty. Um, it, at the moment, the anti-ISIL or ISIS offensive seems to be led primarily by Iran which is a little bit troubling, at least to me. Um, but it's, it's pretty clear that the American public has zero appetite for the old boots on the ground expression. Uh, whether we can contribute the air power coupled with indigenous forces, coupled with the Iranians, which who would have ever thought, um, whether that'll work or not, I'm just not in a position to say, I just don't know. I would commend to folks a Human Rights Watch report that came out today called after liberation destruction. And it's about the areas of Iraq that were taken over by ISIS, ISIL. And now with Iraqi militias moving through, they're destroying whole towns.
and they have uh, the video of this, and it's extremely important to understand you know, what has happened in Iraq today, how, uh, the dev how extensive the devastation is. Marty? I'm sorry the other panelists have left because the question really applies to them as well as to the remaining uh, participants. And that has to do with the fact that we have supposedly 17 intelligence agencies with tens of billions of dollars expended on so-called intelligence. And yet, and yet, we didn't predict the end of the Cold War. We didn't predict 9-11, and we haven't predicted ISIL coming to power the way they did. Can you explain why? Yeah, we've had, uh, I agree, and actually I'm, I'm kind of glad they left, because I, I mean, there are some serious problems with the intelligence community. Um, so. We have to bring them back. Yeah. Why did you think you couldn't raise them with them there? Oh, no, I would have. I mean, I would have, but, uh, you know, well, they might have killed me. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, we've, look, I, I have, what I'm about to tell you is very much a, it's not the majority view amongst, I also, I do presidential history, but I also kind of do intelligence history. And in my view, a lot of damage was done, and I know my colleagues here are not going to agree with this at all. But if you want to penetrate a group like Al-Qaeda or ISIL, uh, you got to do some pretty nasty stuff. And that just does not sit well with the Congressional Oversight Committees, which were created in the mid-1970s after the Church Committee that I alluded to earlier. So I, I think there's been a lot of um, restrictions put in place and a lot of things that make the Congressional Overseers uncomfortable, which is why in explain some of those intelligence failures, not all of them, not all of them. The language problem that I think Director Goss alluded to is, is a critical one as well. And I think we've, we've made some improvements there. But the fact is, if, and, and I grant you, we need to have a debate in this country. How much of a player do we want to be on the world stage? If the answer is we want to be, then you need an intelligence community that's going to be doing things that are not necessarily going to make us proud all the time. But that, you know, there's not an intelligence service in the world that doesn't undertake uncomfortable actions, to say the least. And especially if you're talking about a group like ISIL or Al-Qaeda. If you're talking about the U.S. engaging in torture, I think torture, the practice of torture, um, threatens our national security. Uh, what it did in the lead up to Iraq, it's very interesting to hear Mr. Negroponte say that he had serious questions about going to war in Iraq. But this came from faulty information that came from people who were tortured, who gave information that they thought that their torturers wanted to hear. So when you question whether congressional oversight um, serves a democratic society, I think the only thing that doesn't serve it is when intellig the intelligence community is not overseen. That's what we've seen through the Bush administration. Uh, yeah, and I, I would just point out, if I could, that on the question of at least waterboarding, we do know that key members of the, of the intelligence committees were briefed, including Nancy Pelosi. And we won't go down this path because I believe she's since denied that, but there's pretty good evidence to indicate these folks were told, and in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, the word back was, do whatever the hell you have to do, and if need be, do more. So, so at the very least, let's just, if you're opposed to torture, don't focus your fire exclusively on the Bush White House. A lot of it was coming from Capitol Hill as well. Uh, do, do you believe that there was any chance that any intelligence with, that indicated a contrary conclusion would have prevented that war? I'm, I, I know what you will say, I think, but the doctor not. Uh, if they were here, I would have addressed it to them, to Negroponte and Gus. I don't share the view uh, that Bush on 9-12 was determined to go after mm -hmm. Iraq. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty clear that people like Paul Wolfowitz were. He was the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. um, I think Bush had to be persuaded over time. I also, by the way, don't buy the view that it was because Saddam tried to kill his father. I think there's a lot of crazy stuff out there. Um, but I do think Bush was radicalized by 9-11, and there's a clear link to 
the invasion of what Iraq. What is the connection between 9-11 well, um, and the invasion of Iraq? Just that it radicalized Bush. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda was, the Al-Qaeda Saddam stuff is fiction. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that Bush himself was radicalized by the events of 9-11 and opted to go big. And go big was to kind of send a shockwave through a part of the world, and that the phrase was used at the time, pardon the expression, drain the swamp. The swamp being these semi-states that were providing shelter for groups like Al-Qaeda, again, not Iraq, but that somehow by sending this shockwave, you might move that region of the world in a more positive direction. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question. Kayla? To broaden the conversation um, back to uh, the decision to invade Iraq, um, former UN Secretary General, General Kofi Annan uh, said that this was an illegal war, that it was a war of aggression. Um, so, basically, also the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal called uh, the supreme called the supreme international crime the study of preemptive war. Uh, what about accountability for that? Amy Goodman mentioned accountability, and we've been talking about torture, but just to broaden the, the scope. Would you call this an illegal war right off the bat, even without Al Libby and so on? I guess is my question. Well, in terms of strictly American legality, uh, you know, the authorization to use force or whatever. Yeah, the initial authorization to use force against Afghanistan in the fall winter of 01. Then you did have Congress go on record, essentially giving Bush the authority to use force if he thought that was appropriate. And again, we should point out that there was pretty decent bipartisan support for giving Bush this authority. Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, John Kerry, Harry Reid, Richard Gephardt, et cetera, et cetera. So from a strictly American standpoint, I have a hard time viewing Iraq as an illegal war. Uh, it, it was certainly more legal than President Obama's use of force in Libya two or three years ago where he didn't even go to Congress at all. But uh, internationally, though. Yeah. Well, I'll let I'll let these well, folks. No, but I, I, mean, I think we've been pretty clear as the judge saying that this was a violation of international law. Okay, I'm trying. Um, I, it, it, to us, I can't. I, I, I can't speak for for Amy Goodman, but. Um, it's it just just stand sit closer to it. That's all. Um, I, mean, I can't speak for Amy Goodman. I think it's clearly a violation of international law. The United States uh, went into Iraq without the backing of the United Nations, attacking a country um, that had not attacked us and was in where there was no like, imminent likelihood that they would attack us. So you know, this seems to me kind of a you know very self-evident point. The, the point, the 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 practical situation is that there's nobody in the world that can call us to account. You know, and I think it's very, very important to keep, you know, as a sort of overarching perspective, the extent to which folks in the Bush administration were really people who were looking around in the aftermath of the Cold War. I think it took a while for that to really sink in that we didn't have the Soviet Union as, a, as an enemy anymore. Uh, we didn't have to be careful about certain things that we hesitated to do before. And you really had coming to power in the Bush administration people who ha were taking the view that now that we were the sole superpower, that we were able to exert our influence and use our power in ways that we had not done previously. And so in that context, um, the idea that you would go and attack another country that doesn't threaten you directly, that is not committed active aggression, that became somehow an acceptable idea. Um, and I'm not sure that we've learned our lesson from that, you know, from that either. I, mean, I, I, I don't see any possible way to justify this in terms of international law. Ms. Gooden. And I just wanted to end by saying, I think it's important when, uh, so important what Hofstra is doing, evaluating presidencies. But I also think it's important to evaluate the grassroots movements that are the true movers and shakers, the bravery of those who have spoken out and continued to speak out. Um, you know, Barbara Lee, the Congress member from Oakland, California, as you pointed out, Hillary Clinton and many others in the Democratic leadership voted for war. 
there's no question voted to authorize um, at the end of 2002. Barbara Lee stood alone in those weeks after September 11th saying that war is not the answer, that she would not sign any blank check for war if we wanted to make ourselves safer. And I think 14 years later, in 2015, as we look back, this woman was prophetic. And it's the movements that she represented and those that she didn't. These also deserve a university examination to give voice to those who lost their lives, who continue to speak out, who are imprisoned, um, who are the targets of US foreign policy. We have to hear from all of them and their loved ones when they can't speak for themselves. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nott has asked for the last word Just here, I guess, because it is the last word. <laughs> Just a very relatively minor point, but I think it hasn't been mentioned yet, at least I didn't hear it. There's no question that the neocons were itching, uh, many of them, to get even, in a sense, or to go into Iraq. Uh, but it is also important to note that under President Clinton, with congressional ac acquiescence, mm -hmm. uh, regime change became the official policy of the United States government during the Clinton years, not the Bush years. That doesn't necessarily justify the 03 invasion, but there were a series of steps that you can see sort of leading to mm -hmm. the invasion. Well, I, I, would, I would like to thank especially our surviving panelists. And uh, I want to thank all of you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Do you have a card? I didn't do any of I'm at the Naval War College. Okay. I'm easy to find.